Chapter One of the Rose Child by Johanna Spirey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rose Child by Johanna Spirey. Chapter First The Time of the Roses. Dietrich, the sheriff of Wildbach, who had once owned considerable property, had for several years been falling into bad ways, and by this means had lost his position and his salary. His only occupation was cutting a few tufts of grass from his uncultivated fields, and carrying it home to feed his poor little goat. For himself and his foster-child there were only a few potatoes and a little milk. After dinner, Dietrich would vanish and not appear again until toward night to milk the goat. Then he was seen no more at home, but every one knew that he sat in the tavern until late at night, and that soon house and land and goat would be taken away from him to pay his debts. As long as his wife had lived things had gone better. They had had more land, and a cow, and the wife had worked industriously early and late. They had never had any children of their own, but an orphan niece of Dietrich's had been living with them for three years. He had lost his wife the year before, and since then had gone so rapidly from bad to worse that every one wondered at the child's fresh, blooming appearance. She was now eight years old, and was everywhere called Rose Resley, for she was never seen without a rose in her hand or in her mouth. Resley, her real name was Teresa, had such a love for roses that she gazed with her merry blue eyes so longingly into every garden where roses grew that the owners inside would call out kindly would you like one and rose restly beaming with delight would stretch her little hand through the fence and receive her prize gratefully so the child was always seen surrounded with roses as soon as they began to bloom and every one knew the blooming rose restly and were fond of her she did not see much of her uncle in the morning she went to school, and at noon he usually said, I shall not be home to-night, but you will find something to eat. But the cupboard was always empty. It was well that here and there a child at school gave Rose Restley apples or pears, or even a slice of bread, and often when she had to go hungry she could run freely to the gardens round about where the roses grew, and gather a few, and in this pleasure she would forget everything else. Today again the child had found no supper, but for all that she skipped happily across the meadows. It was a bright summer evening. The butterflies were fluttering up and down in the blue air, and high above the swallows flew round in a circle, twittering, summer-like, and all about in the meadows the crickets were chirping merrily, so that Rose Resley became more and more gladsome and jumped higher and higher as if she would fly away with the butterflies. Thus in a short time she came to a garden which lay at a distance on a wooded hill, and always had the most beautiful roses. The garden was surrounded by a wooden fence, and Rose Restley quickly climbed up on the lower rail and looked longingly into the garden. "'Come right in,' called a voice from behind the trees. "'I know very well what you are looking for. Today you shall have some more roses.' Rose Restley didn't wait to be asked a second time. She stepped quickly inside went straight to the fragrant rose-bed, and looked in wonderment at the multitude of red and white, light and dark blossoms, glowing and giving forth their perfume together. Then the president's wife, the owner of the garden, came up to her. She had many times before given roses to Resley, and had just now called her to come in. "'You have come at just the right time to-day, Resley,' she said. "'You shall have a big bunch, but many of the roses are ready to fall, you see.' so you must be a little quiet and not jump so high, as you usually do, or all the petals will fall off the flowers before you reach home. Then the President's wife carefully cut a rose here and another there, and then two together, light and dark red and white, until she made a big, large, wonderful bouquet. Rose Resley's eyes grew bigger and bigger, for she had never held anything so wonderfully beautiful in her hand before but here and there the fragrant petals were falling to the ground, and the bare stems looked so sad among the other flowers that Rose Resley seemed quite alarmed. 
see see said the lady warningly you will have to walk very slowly to your house or you will not have three left with their petals on when you get there rose resley thanked her politely and started on her way back this led her past a miserable little hut where lived the sorrow mother a quiet woman with a sorrowful face rose resley had never heard her called anything else and had supposed that she had no other name sorrow mother called resley when she saw the old woman at the window see see have you ever seen such roses no resley not for a long time replied the woman and the child went on her way quite absorbed in the sweetness and beauty of her flowers as resley was passing the last house on the road the woman of the house called the peasant woman of the crossway because she lived where two roads crossed came out and with both of her strong arms on her hips looked at the child well well you are really a rose resley to-day she called to her come show me your treasures close to rose resley turned quickly round and joyfully held her bouquet out to her but with her quick movement the petals dropped from three or four of the roses and fluttered to the ground resley looked at them sadly too bad said the woman but they would be just right for me child give me your roses and you shall have a good piece of bread for them you can't carry them any farther by the time you get home you will have nothing but stems in your hand come give them to me all my roses and not have any to keep asked resley quite taken aback you can keep one of them see this one the others will fall right away come lay them in here they mustn't be lost and the peasant woman held out her apron resley laid her roses in it all except one which she placed in the front of her little dress where she almost always wore a rosebud then the peasant woman went into the house and soon came back again with a big slice of bread in her hand at the sight of which the child suddenly realized that she was very hungry listen resley i will give you some good advice said the peasant woman as she gave the bread to the child take a little basket go every evening where there are roses growing and ask for the ones that are ready to fall then put them right into the basket so that you will not lose the leaves for i need them and every evening if you will bring me a nice little pile of petals you shall have a good big piece of bread will you do it yes surely said rose resley and started on her way home eating her bread with great satisfaction when the child passed by the sorrow mother's cottage again she was coming along home carrying on her back the bundle of faggots she had gathered what has become of your beautiful roses she asked when the child came up to her resley told her the whole story and how she was going to bring rose leaves every day to the crossroad woman the sorrow mother listened thoughtfully then she said timidly resley won't you come to me to-morrow before you take the roses to the peasant woman i should like to ask you something then yes i will do that so sleep well sorrow mother whereupon resley went on her way when she reached her uncle's distant cottage she went into the silent lonely room she closed no door made no light like a little bird she sought her nest in the gloaming and soon was sleeping peacefully she dreamed of her roses until the bright sun wakened her again end of chapter one chapter two of the rose child by johanna spirey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter second a little helper and great help the woman whom the people had given the name of sorrow mother was a very poor widow she had seen better days and was not accustomed to beg she starved and suffered in silence told her trouble only to the dear lord and sought in him alone to find the consolation she needed her husband who had been a tailor died young and left her only one son like his father he was to be a tailor this the boy's guardian had resolved upon and he was the one to decide the matter but joseph did not like this when he ought to be working at his trade he ran away and came home late at night or not at all so he fell into bad company and his guardian 
who was also overseer of the parish threatened if he would not work and do well to send him on the next transport to australia joseph was very much broken up by this and said that he could work if they would let him do what he wanted and if he could go away from home without being sent then he disappeared and never came back his mother mourned for him greatly but she gave her child up to the dear lord and when the people in the village said scornfully what good has it been for you to pray so much you are living in poverty with your sorrow and joseph will die in poverty far away then she would answer if i have to remain a sorrowing mother to the end and have to die in poverty i will not lose my faith that joseph will return to the right way for i have from the beginning and always again and again given him into the dear lord's keeping and have prayed for him so much that it cannot be in vain the next day as soon as school was over rose resley started off the child did not own a basket but she could pile the roses in her apron skipping merrily along she came to the large garden where the president's wife was wandering about among her flowers would you like to see some roses resley she asked the child come in there are one or two more left to give you only the ones that are ready to fall said resley holding out her little apron so that to-day she might not let a single leaf fall to the ground yes if you like them so you can have your whole apron full come over here and the president's wife led the child to a large bed full of roses which were wide open or had already dropped half their leaves here she cut off so many that rose resley had her apron quite full may i come again to-morrow asked resley expectantly certainly you may replied the lady you shall have all these that are wide open if you take pleasure in them rose resley thanked her and ran along much delighted when she reached the tumble-down cottage where the sorrow mother lived the child remembered her promise to stop there she stepped into the low little room where the sorrow mother sat at the spinning wheel she greeted resley with great friendliness then she went to her window cut off two red roses from the little rose-bush growing there and held them out to the child see resley she said hesitatingly i want to ask you if you will take these two rosebuds also with you perhaps the peasant woman will give you a little more bread for them even if it is a very small piece will you do this resley yes yes replied the child quickly and then i will bring the bread right to you i will be back again soon the crossway woman was standing in front of her house by the wall of her vegetable garden and looking first into one and then into another of the baskets standing on the wall and in which the beautiful fragrant rose leaves were spread out to dry in the sun every year the peasant woman made a sweet smelling rose water and for this she used a great many rose leaves which were not very easy to get that's right she said with satisfaction as rose resley came and opened her apron to-day you shall have a fine piece of bread i have two more said resley holding up high the sorrow mother's rosebuds throw them on the others they are very small indeed but perhaps they will have a couple of leaves but i should very much like to have a separate piece of bread for them said resley still holding them fast in her hand i know very well said the peasant woman stepping into the house we were all like that once now and then at school we swapped a piece of bread for a pear or a couple of prunes it's so i know resley there take the big piece in exchange for the roses in your apron and here is a little one for the other two are you satisfied with this yes yes really resley assured her thanked her many times and started to return she laid the small piece of bread in her apron for the sorrow mother and immediately bit eagerly into the large piece for she had had very little to eat at noon and at night there was nothing at all so the whole piece of bread had come to an end before resley reached the little old house now she was there and stepped inside and exclaimed here sorrow mother here is your bread the woman took the child's hand and pressed it gratefully you don't know how much good you are doing me resley she said you see out in the garden 
I have potatoes, which are my only food. But often my stomach can't bear them any longer. Bread is too dear for me. And then, when I eat almost nothing, I grow so weak, I am no longer able to spin. So I am glad to have your bread, Resli, and thank you heartily for it. Then Rose Resli was sorry that she had brought only the small piece of bread to the sorrow mother, and had kept the large piece for herself. And she kept thinking in her heart, Oh, if I had only eaten the little piece instead of the big one! And she looked quite cast down. The sorrow mother thought she was still hungry, and wanted to give back the little piece of bread to her. But Resli said, No, no, I don't want it. I have already had enough. Tomorrow I will come again. And away she went. On the following evening she came promptly back again. Once more the president's wife had filled her apron with roses, and again the sorrow mother had broken off two rosebuds from the bush and given them to Resli. When she reached the crossway woman's and took the roses out of her apron, Resli said, "'Can I have one piece of bread today, but as big as the two together?' "'You see, I guessed right,' replied the peasant woman. "'Now you have found out that it is a shame to swap good bread for apples and pears. That is right. Only keep it.' and to-day it is quite fresh, so you shall have a fine piece. Come with me. The peasant woman went into her kitchen, and cut from the large loaf of bread the biggest piece Resli had ever held in her hand in all her life. She ran quickly to the sorrow mother, and beaming with delight laid the whole piece in her hand. Not a morsel had the child taken out of it to-day. Like a weight it had lain on her heart that she had kept the large piece of bread and brought the small one to the sorrow mother her eyes shone with delight when the old woman looked in amazement at her piece of bread she held it out to the child saying what is this resli it is surely your bread come take it take it if you will break off just a little piece of it i will thank you no no i will not take a single crumb of it said the child good night and to-morrow I will come again. I have no more roses, Resli, but I thank you. You don't know how much good you have done me. There were tears in the woman's eyes as she called after the child. Resli had noticed this, and for a moment she became quite thoughtful. Then something came to her mind, and Resli was glad in her heart once more, sang and jumped for joy, and thought out what she would do the next day. So the president's wife had no more roses but Resli in her rambles had become acquainted with so many other gardens that she had no trouble in finding other roses, and she was so quick and light-footed that no place was too far away for her. So every evening she brought her apron full of roses to the peasant woman, and received every time her piece of bread, which was larger rather than smaller, for the peasant woman was very much pleased with what Resli did. A neighbor, who also prepared rose-water, sometimes looked on with envy when she saw resli shake out her full apron and said it was no wonder if the crossway woman could make better rose-water than she if she knew how to procure such beautiful rose-leaves she would succeed as well resli never ate any more of the bread the sorrow mother had to have it all although she objected and wanted to share it with the child from time to time resli would ask sorrow mother is the bread doing you good then the poor woman would tell her again and again how much stronger she felt, since she had bread to eat every day, how much more she could spin and earn, so that she would not have to suffer with the cold in the winter as usual. Finally, she always said, If I only could repay you for what you were doing for me, Resli. But Resli's face beamed with such delight that one could see that she already had received the best reward. Thus it went on, until the time of the roses was over. One evening, when Resli had run far and wide, and had looked into all the gardens in vain, and at last brought only three half-withered roses to the peasant woman, she said, It is all over with the roses, but next year you must bring me your lovely rose-leaves again. These words made an impression on Resli, which the peasant woman had not expected. She supposed that such a child would receive something here and there from kind people, and not depend so much on her piece of bread. But Resli was thinking of the sorrow mother, and what would happen to her now if she had nothing to eat 
but her few potatoes big tears came into her eyes as she saw that the roses were all gone no no you must not cry resli said the peasant woman sympathetically promise me that next summer you will again bring me many beautiful roses and you shall have your piece of bread every day all through the winter will you do it then her tears were quickly dried and resli beamed with delight yes indeed i will and you shall have all all the roses and forget-me-nots too i don't need them but the roses don't forget them there is your piece of bread and now it is time for apples and you must have some of those there resli and the peasant woman reached for a big red-cheeked apple and offered it together with the piece of bread to the child in highest glee resli ran off with her treasures and the peasant woman gazed after her with gratification for she was fond of resli and delighted that she was so happy besides she was pleased to have already assured the finest roses for herself the coming summer she had particularly noticed how her neighbor was always looking over at her rose leaves and she had been a little anxious lest she might entice resli away for the following summer for she must have surely found out that the child brought her fine roses the sorrow mother too had a happy evening when resli who always brought sunshine into the old woman's lonely room told her everything she had arranged with the peasant woman the sorrow mother folded her hands and silently thanked the dear lord for having sent the child like a good angel to her and that now she could look forward to the dreaded winter with so much less anxiety and concern end of chapter two chapter three of the rose child by Johanna Spirey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Third Rose Resley's Trouble. Some days later, it appeared as if a wonderful change had taken place, as if the sorrow mother and Rose Resley had exchanged natures. The woman was sitting with a calm, happy face by her spinning wheel. Then Resley stepped in, looking as troubled as if something had happened which would take away her joyousness for all time what is the matter resli what is the matter asked the sorrow mother in alarm i have a hole in my dress she cried out in a very fierce tone and at school the children all laughed at me they ran behind me and kept singing louder and louder rose resli rose stock rose resli hole in your frock and at the recollection of the insult which she had to bear great tears rolled down resli's cheeks it was not nice of the children to laugh at you perhaps they didn't mean to be so naughty come here resli show me the tear we will mend it said the sorrow mother comfortingly resli stepped up to her and she did not have to hunt long to find the hole for it was very large the kind old woman had the child sit down on a stool brought her thread and needle and began the work immediately but resli could not forget her trouble at once and sobbed aloud be comforted resli said the sorrow mother kindly such a trouble shall never happen to you again i will look at your little frock carefully every evening and mend every little hole at once and if you catch it and it tears come quickly to me and i will make it whole right away now can you be happy again yes i can be now said resli quite consoled and she wiped away her tears but i thought every morning i should have another hole and so they would run after me every day and sing behind me rose resli rose stock and so i thought i would never go to school again yes indeed resli you must go that is a law and a good one or else you would never learn anything and you see nobody must run away when trouble comes we must hold still and bear it because the dear lord always has something to teach us in this way which we should not learn otherwise for when we are in the midst of trouble and sorrow we seek help and comfort from him and learn to know him and then trust comes into our hearts because we perceive that we have a father in heaven who stands by us and hears when we call do you pray to him too resli the child thought for a moment then she said yes in school what do you pray in school resli began and without taking breath for fear of losing the sound of the words and not be able to go on 
she said as fast as she could how the morning hour rejoices those that wake and praise the lord thankful hearts and happy voices with his children well accord now i don't know any more the sound of the words had escaped her so she knew no more it is a beautiful little verse but you said it rather too fast resli have you thought what it means no i have not replied resli you see it means that when you awake in the morning you should think of the dear lord the first thing and rejoice and thank him for having protected you all through the night that is the way to pray in the morning but do you know a little prayer for the evening no i don't know any then you can only pray from your heart to the dear lord and ask him to forgive you if you have done anything wrong during the day and ask him to help you so that you will not do it again you see resli when we can pray right to the dear lord we become quite happy again if i did not do that always i should have died from trouble long ago why asked resli wondering you see i have had cause enough i am so very poor and have hardly enough to live on besides i have a child out in the world a son and i know nothing about him perhaps he is dying in poverty or is already dead and if i did not entrust him to the dear lord every evening as i did in the first hour of his life and say he is thine help him i could never go to sleep on account of my anxiety and grief but when i have prayed so comfort and trust come into my heart i will help you to pray for him said resli that delights me child that delights me if you pray for joseph it will be good for you too that i know and you will need it if you are able to pray aright why asked resli again see my child began the sorrow mother affectionately but a little anxiously your uncle has done wrong and they say that soon his house and land will be taken away from him then you will have to go to strangers and that means much work and few kind words you know nothing about that now and so it will be well if you know the way to the dear lord so that you can tell him all your troubles and find comfort in him then i will come and live with you said resli more pleased than troubled oh you dear child i couldn't take care of you at all something quite different will happen but we will tell the dear lord about it and he will provide for you so now it is all mended said the sorrow mother who while she was talking had looked over the child's little frock carefully and mended it if you need anything again come to me and i will help you resli thanked her politely and ran away with a lightened heart now she would never be laughed at in school again and this assurance delighted resli so much that she quite forgot about the sorrow mother's telling her how perhaps she would have to go to strangers soon and have to do hard work resli did not forget her promise for when she lay down to sleep she prayed quite loud from her heart dear lord do help joseph a long hard winter followed the sorrow mother had to suffer much from the cold but not from hunger as in years before and so she kept what little health she had rose resli was her support and her breadwinner in the late autumn she had seen the sorrow mother with the greatest effort dragging home a little bundle of faggots since then she had gone every day into the forest and found so much wood that the sorrow mother was able to make a fire every day in her little room and cook her bread soup on the little stove every evening after school in spite of cold storm and snow rose resli appeared at the crossway woman's quite a time quite blue from the cold and shivering in every limb although she had been given another dress for the winter it was not very warm and she had only a thin shawl over her neck and shoulders so when the peasant woman saw the child shivering and with her teeth chattering so from the cold she thought she must be suffering from hunger to come running through storm and tempest for the sake of a piece of bread this made her sorry and she cut deep into the loaf so that the piece was even larger than it had ever been in the summer but the child carried it all to the sorrow mother and firmly refused her entreaties to eat half of it herself if resli often went hungry to bed she was glad that the sorrow mother was not in need and prayed dear lord help joseph and went to sleep happy under the sorrow mother's care her little frock remained in good condition all winter long and the school children no longer laughed at her or ridiculed her End of chapter three
Chapter Four of the Rose Child by Johanna Spirey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourth Sorrow Mother No Longer. Summer had come again, and in all the gardens the roses were blooming and giving forth their fragrance. They were in full bloom in all the beds. The young plants bore quite a burden of blossoms, and they nodded down from the flower pots in all the windows. It was a great rose year. The summer evening lay brightly over Wildbach, and all the meadows and woods round about. The golden evening sunlight shone on Dietrich's little house, and its glittering windows could be seen from far away. But in front of it, two men were standing, with thoughtful faces. One was Uncle Dietrich. He knew that on the morrow house, fields, and goat would all be taken away from him, and in spite of that, he would still be deep in debt. He thrust both hands in his pockets and said angrily, I will go away. I will know nothing more about it. But you must not forget that you will be found, said the other. I will take the child home with me. She really can't work, for you have let her run wild, but I will soon teach her how to use the hoe. After school there are many hours, then she shall help me. She is still young, said the uncle. All the easier to teach, replied the other, and went on his way. It was the road-mender of Wildback, and he had to dig out the weeds from the roads and clear them off. All the children were afraid of him and kept out of his way, for he was very cross and rough and never spoke a friendly word. To this man Rose Resley was to go early the next morning. He had no children of his own, and it seemed to him quite right to take home such a child as this to do all kinds of drudgery for him. The child herself had no idea of what the men had decided. Even now she was wandering cheerfully through the meadows, far beyond Wildback, on her way to the mill. Here there was a garden full of marvellous roses, and the miller's wife had promised Resley a large bunch of them. Soon after, the child was seen, with her roses in her hand, going back happily by the same road in the golden evening light. She had not gone far when a young man, with quick footsteps, came up behind her. He was holding his straw hat in his hand, and let the fresh, cooling air blow over his head. "'You have some beautiful roses,' he exclaimed, when he had caught up with Resley. "'Will you give me one to put in my hat?' Resley nodded in assent, and took one out. "'That is kind of you. You have given me the most beautiful one of all,' said the stranger, as he placed it with satisfaction in his hat. "'How far are you going?' "'I am going home to Wildback,' was the reply. Then we are going the same way, said the traveller, and walked along with Resley. If you are from Wildback, you must know the people there well, and can tell me something. Does good Frau Steinman live there still, and is she well? I don't know her, replied Resley. Nobody there has that name. Oh, my God, my God, groaned the stranger, and was silent. Resley looked at him wonderingly for from time to time he wiped away a tear and no longer looked happy as before. After they had walked along together for some time in silence, the stranger began again. Do you know the way to the crossway woman? Resley nodded very emphatically and said, I go there every day. Then tell me who lives in the old tumble-down house there at the left of the road where the crooked willow tree stands. The sorrow mother lives there. I know her well. What kind of a name is that? hasn't she any other i don't know any other is she called so because she has had a great deal of sorrow do you know yes she has sorrow because she doesn't know whether joseph is living in misery or not oh my god my god exclaimed the stranger again and suddenly strode away so that he left resley quite a distance behind but he turned back again took the child by the hand and said very kindly Come, let us walk along together and talk a little more. And he looked so kind and friendly that Resley felt quite trustful. Tell me, he continued, is the sorrow mother angry with Joseph? Oh, no, every night she prays for him, or else she could not go to sleep, and I help her, too. Is that so? And what do you pray for him? I pray, dear Lord, do help Joseph. Perhaps the dear Lord has heard you now and has helped him. "'Do you believe it?' asked Resley, looking with the greatest interest at the stranger, whose face suddenly lighted up with joy. He said nothing more. Now they came to the crooked willow tree, a few steps from the little old house. "'Well, good-bye,' 
said Resley, as she held out her hand to the stranger, evidently somewhat disappointed at his silence. I am going to see the Sorrow Mother. I will go with you, he said quickly. But before they opened the door, it was burst open from the inside, and out rushed the Sorrow Mother, embraced the stranger, and exclaimed again and again, Oh, Joseph, Joseph, is it really you? And she wept aloud for joy, and Joseph had to weep with her. And now when Resli realized that the stranger was Joseph, who had returned to the Sorrow Mother, and looked so well, and not so shabby as she had imagined him, she did not know how to contain herself for joy. She hugged the weeping mother and cried exultingly, The dear Lord has helped him! The dear Lord has helped him! Then all three went into the little house, and the Sorrow Mother looked her son over from head to foot, and her heart overflowed with thankfulness and joy, for he did not look like one who had been sunk into the depths, and gone to ruin in poverty, as she had so often, in her chamber at night, imagined him to be. She could not look at him enough. He looked so good to her. "'Come, mother, come,' said the young man, with a happy face. "'Now let us sit down together and have something to eat, and be merry. Can the child bring us something?' "'Oh, yes. She has done that already,' affirmed the mother. "'How much good she has brought me before, and now has brought even my son. Where did you find him, Resley?' "'I will tell you all about that, mother, but let the child go and get some sausages, a bottle of wine, and a big loaf of bread.' requested Joseph, laying a large piece of money on the table. "'A whole loaf?' asked Resley, with the greatest astonishment, for she could hardly believe that the Sorrow Mother was to have a whole loaf all at once. But she flew away in such delight over it that she was back again with all the provisions in an incredibly short space of time. Then all three sat down at the little table and had a feast, such as was never seen in the room before, but the mother could hardly eat for joy, and kept asking, full of astonishment, Is this really true, Joseph? And he quite gaily assured her, each time that it was, and gave Resley one slice of bread after another, and sausages, too. And if she said, No, no, I really can't eat any more. It is for the sorrow, mother. Then he would reply, Just eat, and don't worry. Mother shall never again suffer want. She shall have enough bread every day. And now, said Joseph, when he had been quite refreshed after his long journey, now I will tell you, mother, how things have gone with me. You know, I was to be sent to Australia, but the disgrace of being sent away I would not have, and I couldn't stay here any longer, so I ran away. I went over to England, and there I stayed, because I had no money to go any farther. I had hard times there, had to work hard, to earn my living, and thought I should go to destruction. I really believe your prayer saved me, mother, for every time when things were at their worst, and I was tempted to do wrong, I suddenly heard you, as you used to pray, in your room beside me, that the dear Lord might bring all misery upon you, if only he would at last lead me in the right way. Then I saw you before me, and couldn't do anything wrong, to bring you to the grave, and I began to work again. I had work in the machine shops, and little by little I improved. In nine years one can learn something, if one wants to and I wanted to, and now I am a skilled mechanic, and shall always find work. And now, mother, you shall have something else. No one shall dare call you sorrow, mother, again. See, mother, I have brought you my savings. Now tell me how you have fared. Whereupon Joseph laid his beautiful hard-earned dollars before his mother on the table, and the joy in his heart shone out of his eyes when he saw his mother's increasing astonishment. Oh, that you should earn all that through hard, honest work, Joseph. I don't know how to thank the dear Lord. It is almost too much. And the good mother had to fold her hands and give praise and thanks again and again. But her son said, Tell me now how it has been with you, mother. There is not much to tell, Joseph, she said. I have had hard times and much trouble, and they did not call me the sorrow mother without good cause. The dear Lord has always helped me through. But in these last years I have been so very poor, and lost my strength, so I thought I should not live through another winter. Then, like an angel from heaven, came the child, Rose Resley, and she gave me back my strength. The whole winter through, and until now, she has supported me, and I know she has often brought me her bread and gone hungry herself. And now I have only one cause for complaint, Joseph. Resley lives with her uncle Dietrich, and tomorrow he loses his house and home. The child has to go to strangers, and who knows how it will be with her. 
what the child who has taken care of you mother interrupted joseph indignantly we have enough for the child too no one needs to give us anything for her i will go to dietrich rose wesley shall not leave us again and he shot out of the door and hurried away then wesley jumped from her stool fell on the old woman's neck and cried out in her delight again and again sorrow mother sorrow mother now i can live with you now i shall not have to go away again and the mother held the child fast and said oh wesley how much we have to be thankful for if we thank the dear lord as long as we live it will not be enough never forget that in all your life now the last trouble is taken away from my heart and you must not call me sorrow mother any more for i am not so any longer but i will be a mother to you when the uncle dietrich learned from joseph what he desired he was glad for secretly he was fond of resley he was unwilling to give her to the cross-road mender but he didn't know at the time of any other way for he had to leave early the next morning so he said to joseph take the child right away don't send her back to sleep but take her little bed at once he thought the matter would be safer in this way for if the road mender came early in the morning he could not take resley with him joseph was much pleased and pressed another piece of money into dietrich's hand for he had heard that the uncle had never been unkind to resley so he took the little bed and its scanty contents on his shoulder and came home quite happy with it it was placed in the little chamber next to the mother's bed and resley was unspeakably happy because now she could remain day and night with her joseph found his sleeping place just as he had left it nine years before his mother had thought every day during this time perhaps he will come back and then he must still find a home and joseph was so happy to have found his home again that he would not have left it for any money he found the work that he wanted for he was a skilled expert workman every morning when he went to work resley placed a rose in his hat this pleased joseph very much and made him feel happy at his work he always had a rose even when there were no more to be seen anywhere about for resley knew every place where a last rose could be blooming and she obtained the rose from the one to whom it belonged as soon as the story became known how resley had supported the sorrow mother for a whole year long almost alone everybody loved her even much more than before and wherever she went she received roses from the gardens whether they were the first or the last so the three happy people lived together in the smallest house in Waldebach, and rose resley will be her name all her life long end of chapter four and end of the rose child by johanna spirey